Welcome. My name is Hildo. I'm, well, I kind of am also a teacher for this master, except next month I'm moving to Germany, so I'm not going to teach you guys. But uh, I've been teaching this master for quite a while, and Bart has asked me to give a guest lecture because the stuff that we do, the engineering fundamentals, making simulations, is something that I used to do, that I studied at, I did a PhD at, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, before I'm going to get started, I'm going to give a small teacher about my own course, data science, except I'm leaving. Um, Bart will take my job there. So, thanks, Bart. Yeah. Um, next period, you're going to get data science, which is taught by Johan and not me anymore. Um, and I just want to give you like a very short teaser so that you can perhaps also start looking for projects. Um, engineering fundamentals, your current course, you model stuff. You know how it works, and then you use that to make predictions. With data science, you just have a ton of data, but you don't really know how it works. We use it for problems that are hard to model, that have a lot of data, and where the patterns aren't really visible. We don't really have the physics to describe it. So, for example, giving recommendations on Netflix for banks, is this credit card transaction fraud or not? For engineering, when do we need to do maintenance? When will our stuff break down? Um, another thing that happened, Connectera has a company that tracks the health of cows. They put like a motion sensor on the cow and if a cow starts walking less, oh, he might be ill, let's send him to the doctor. Or Tesla, self-driving cars. They all use various types of data science. Why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because next period you can choose your own assignments and it could be totally fictional. We are going to be a consultant to uh, Ronaldo on how to improve his game. Or it could be for an actual company, so you can go to a company and be like, hey, do you want us to do some data science stuff for you? Um, so that's the assignment. It must have a few requirements. There must be some kind of business case, like what's the actual goal you want to reach, something that adds value. Must have a large amount of data, stuff that you don't do manually, because otherwise, why do you need a computer? And it must be done through data analysis methods in Python. We're going to use Python, because you also learned that, and then we can use that. So if you want to know more about that, go to the Canvas side. It's already online. Uh, we do it in groups of three or four students, usually four. So if you think, hey, this is cool. I want to do it for an actual company. I want to start approaching them. Find your friends. Go write companies. Should be fine. So that's just the first thing that I want to say. Are assignments in groups? Uh, for data science, they are in groups of four students, at most four. Three is also fine. Um, so what are we going to talk about in the next hour or so? First, I want to give a short introduction about my own background. And then, this is engineering, we're going to do experiments. Yes, you will do experiments. It's going to be fun. Um, it has to do with aircraft. Uh, whilst, once we've done the experiments, we're going to look at some basic modeling techniques. We're going to start with a very simple model, a one differential equation. Then we're going to make them more complicated. In state space form, we're going to look at the modes of vibrations of aircraft, how we examine that also in practice in the industry. And then once we have got a basic understanding of airplanes, we're going to do some more experiments and see if we can actually see the theory in real life. So we're going to fly our own airplane, which is going to be cool. After that, I'm going to give you the quick teaser of everything else that's possible. You're going to be like, whoa, how are the advanced modeling techniques working? What is control theory? What is adaptive control system identification? It's going to be a, a quick one, because basically you can do a PhD in that field. And I did my PhD in adaptive control, and I'm kind of still a noob on system identification. It just goes to show you that it's really a big field. What is my goal with this lecture? See this as a guest lecture from industry. This is not stuff that's going to come on the exam. Um, I'm not going to teach you guys the mathematics either. We have a reader for that mathematics. You do that through practice. So that's not the whole point. The point is to just give you an idea of, OK, what is the stuff that we learn actually good for? Can we use this? So I want to provide you with the insights and in how everything is used, for example, in actual projects in the industry, and maybe inspire you for your own projects. Now, who am I? Um, this is me, kind of my resume. I studied aerospace engineering in Delft, did a bachelor's there, did my master's on the control and simulation of aerospace vehicles, graduated on self-learning autopilots, which was cool. Did an internship at NASA. You may have heard of it. It's a fancy research institute in uh, the United States who actually do most of their job on airplanes and not so much on space, but somehow everyone knows the space stuff. It's kind of funny. I also did a PhD in machine learning, applying it to wind turbines. A wind turbine has these blades, which are basically airplane wings, so it's like a rotating airplane. Works pretty much the same. 
So that's my background. Um, yeah. And as a result, I'm here teaching you guys about airplanes, because that's kind of my thing. For some reason, everyone knows me as the airplane guy. I have no idea why. But to start, we need to do some experiments. Um, we need airplanes. So I brought some paper. I want you guys for like the next two, three minutes to fold a paper airplane and see if you can make it fly as steady as possible. <laughs> For the people at home, you have three minutes, make your own paper airplane. Good. I'm gonna ah. and check out if it flies steady or if there's some kind of oscillation or something. Okay, that one is absolutely terrible. That is good. This one has done rotating. Oh. And Bart had an also interesting one. It went up and then it went down again. Okay, and also, yeah. Okay, mine is also swiveling. So, thank you. Yep. So, so you do see the oscillation already. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you notice there's different patterns. Sometimes it just wiggles its tail. Sometimes it goes up and down. That one rotated off to the side, just kind of. Down. Are we still have time? Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, I don't think it's gonna work. We'll, we'll do more experiments later. Oh, that was nice. You saw it went up and then it went down again. That was cool. We'll see in a bit why. Oh, it does it again and again. And it also swiveled the tail a bit, so that was cool. We're gonna see why that happens. <clears throat> so the first question is: an airplane, it has tail fins. These thingies. Why does it have those? Stability. stability. If it doesn't have it, it'll just you know plunge up or down. It has to do with stability, that it keeps on going straight and doesn't rotate. And we can kind of do experiments with that. So if you have, I mean, I bought my own airplane, because why not? If you have an airplane and it starts to swivel this way, um, then there's going to be air hitting these, you know, they kind of act like wings as well, the, the tail wings. And that causes a force upwards. What happens to the airplane? It rotates back. And the same thing the other way, if it goes like this, it pushes down, it comes back again. So if we give the airplane an angle, there's going to be a resulting moment. And we can do experiments and make a nice graph. So horizontally, we've got the angle of the airplane, the pitch angle. And vertically, we have the moment resulting from the tail fins. And if we do experiments, we get something like this. If we rotate towards a positive degree, then we have a negative moment. And if we have a negative rotation, we have a positive moment, we go back to our starting point. If we rotate too much, we rotate all the way like this. Does it still work? Not so well. And the wings, they're stalling, and the effects decrease. So if we do the experiment, it will look something like this. Now, the first question is, like, how do we get a graph like this? What do you guys think? What are the options? Experiments. Experiments. Yeah, that's kind of kind of expensive yeah, and uh, and uh, <laughs> scary. Yeah. Simulation. 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 Yeah. 
<clears throat> um, there's a lot of different options. Um, the first one is experiments. It's really expensive, and you can't really do everything. You don't want to crash your airplane. It could be scary. If you want to go a bit easier, there's wind tunnel scale experiments. You make a scale model of the airplane, put it in a wind tunnel, measure all the forces, moments. It's still pretty darn expensive. Wind tunnels aren't cheap. It takes a lot of time to set up. If you want to do it more basic, use advanced computer simulations where you use computational fluid dynamics where you model the entire airflow around the wing. Still expensive. If you want to do it a bit more basic, you can go for nonlinear modeling techniques or linearized modeling, which is what we're going to do. <clears throat> um, what is linearized modeling? It's basically the most basic way of analyzing aircrafts. We're going to assume everything is a straight line. So we're going to assume that this relationship between theta and m is not just you know, some fancy curve. No, it's just a straight line. And then we can put it in a simple equation. m is some constant times theta. And I use the subscript m theta to indicate it's the moment derivative to theta. So that's great. We have a straight line. But how do we find this constant? Well, we can do some maths. How do we find it? Um, the first thing that we do, if we have this wing, there is this lift force. And this lift force, there is an equation for that. Some of you might have seen it. It's the dynamic pressure, hold rho v squared, times some lift coefficient, times the surface area. This is like uh, the air resistance formula, right? Sort of. Um, I mean, for the drag, there's an identical one, but then you use the drag coefficient. Yeah, yeah, OK. Yeah. So this is like the lift force. We have an equation for that. And this lift coefficient, hmm, what does it depend on? Well, it depends on the angle. If you have more angle, uh, turns out it is two pi times theta. We have determined that through uh, mathematical modeling. But this is the force. We want to have the moment. So if this is our airplane, um, here's the force. Moment is force times distance, so we need half of the length of the airplane, basically. So if we have the moment, then it's the for lift force times the half of the length. And then we can plug everything into the equation. And then we should have the moment is, if we put that, we have 2 pi. We have half, so that cancels. So we have half rho v squared area times pi times the length of the airplane times theta. Plug everything together, just maths. And this is our cm theta. Very basic. These formulas are all approximations. They all have you know, limitations. But using very simple physics, we can find our coefficients. And we can you know, determine a linearized model of our airplane. We can find the moment. And this is basically independent of the real shape of the wing, right? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, well, uh, this equation, if you give a, like a cambered wing, so it's okay. curved. It's a little bit different. Then there is like a, a small added factor. Okay. Cool. Cool. So, and this is a very rough approximation. If you have a thicker wing, this one is kind of, it, it starts varying. But yeah, we can do that. So that's great. We have cm theta. Now, what does this say about our differential equation? Well, if we have a moment, then Newton's second law for rotation says, oh, moment equals the rotational inertia, kind of like the mass of the airplane, times the acceleration. Have you looked at this equation before? It's basically like Newton's second law of force is mass times acceleration, but then for rotations. Moment is rotational mass times rotational acceleration. And if we plug that in, we know our moment. We just insert that. Why is my pen not working anymore? Do I have a pen? Nope, I lost my pen. pen. There we go. We plug in the moment. This goes that way. And then we get a differential equation. Now, differential equations you guys should know, right? You have that. And this <coughs> describes the whole behavior of my airplane. Um, this differential equation is a second order equation. Um, 
what kind of output does this get? Does anyone know? Your second derivative is something with the theta. With the power of e, or? No, uh, it's actually a sinusoid. Yeah. Something okay. t. Because what's the first derivative of sine? Cosine. cosine. And what's the derivative of cosine? Minus sine. Minus sine. But I didn't see the minus here, right? Or I mean, c and theta is negative ah, okay. uh, because this line is sloped downwards. If we have a positive moment, we have a negative theta. So if we have this, we get some kind of sinus shape. We get oscillations. And what does this mean in practice? In practice, I mean, if you're like this, we start rotating back, but then we overcompensate, and we rotate back, and we go like this, like this, like this, like this. That's the rotation that we're going to get. Is that also what we see in real life? No, it damps out. But we saw it a little bit in the... In the <clears throat> a little bit. There is some oscillations, but they do damp out in practice. So if that's the case, then we need something more in our differential equation. <clears throat> because the rotational velocity, theta dot, it also has an effect. And if we want to use a linear model, we can also apply that to our differential equation. Our theta dot, our rotational speed, also causes a moment. Because suppose we're rotating downwards, what happens to the tails? They catch more air. If they catch air, that also creates a force. Which way does it go? Up. Yeah. So it counteracts the, moment, uh, the motion as well. And that's the dampening force. We can add that to our equations. Um, this one is also negative. And for our airplane, it's relatively large. Why is it? Well, if you go down, then by going down, you catch more air. You change the angle of attack of the wings. And as a result, you get a very strong extra lift on your tails. And that changes the whole differential equation. So this is cool. So now we have got a differential equation, um, a second order differential equation, using very basic physics. Um, what we can do with that is determine the characteristic values or the eigenvalues. Have you worked with those already? You've seen them come by? We did in the last uh, uh, central lecture, I, I showed you something about how to get the, 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 the oscillations, the, the, the powers of the E, you remember, and that it had to do with the sines and with the cosines, and we did something with the matrices. That, that was like a, a primer for, for this part. Yeah. So there are characteristic values, eigenvalues that you can determine. And I'm just going to give them for like a typical airplane. Um, there are variations, but for a typical airplane, if you look at the characteristic values of their differential equations, we get this. And there's two parts. There's a real and an imaginary part. The real part determines whether it is damped or not. Uh, negative means it's damped. Positive means it grows and it becomes unstable. So this is negative, and minus 4 is relatively large. So we have a strongly damped motion. That's what this part means. This part is the, the coefficient of the, the power of E. So if you've got a negative uh, power uh, coefficient, then it goes down. What this, if you do this in the maths, it becomes E to the power minus 4 plus minus 4 I yeah. T. And this i becomes a sinusoid, so it's like e to the power minus 4t times something with sine or t. That very loosely, this is how it comes out in the equations. So this e to the power minus 4t, that says it's going down to zero. It's dampening out. And this 4 means it is oscillating. There's a complex part, so that means it's oscillating. Great. And this 4 is also high, so it's a relatively high frequency oscillation that quickly dampens out. We have that from our differential equations. Cool. Now, if you talk with a pilot, pilots, they don't know any maths, but they all know about this motion. This is called the short period motion. And we can go to YouTube to see an example. Um, well, I have to turn off my pen and go to YouTube. And it opens on this screen. So here we have an airplane, and it was really quick. Let's do that again. So this is the short period motion. What we do is we quickly give it a small rotation, 
And then we do nothing and see what happens. And this is what happened with the airplane. So very quickly we go back to our stable position. And here you see all the values. Um, this theta, the red line, is the angle. So we can see we gave the kick. It got a velocity, and then it quickly oscillated back to zero to the stable flight. You see that? So what you have with the paper airplanes, sometimes you saw initially it was kind of stabilizing, and then it flew straight. That's typically the short period motion. And this is totally fine. It's a very stable airplane, so that's good. So now let's go back to the slide, because there is more to an airplane. We also saw other types of motion. We also saw it going up and down, and there's more to that. So how do we get there, and can we do other stuff with it too? Well, one thing that we can do is put our whole differential equation in state space form. Have you had that already, matrices, state space? No? OK. In a state space form, what we basically want to do is set up some vector, for example, the angle and the rotational speed, and write it as, or write the derivative. So this is x dot, the derivative of this vector as a function of the vector itself. If you haven't had that, this might be really quick. But if we have this vector, with the angle and the angular speed, and we take the derivative, what do we get? Angular speed and acceleration. Yeah, so that's this one. And we want to express that as a function of the original of the original states. So how does that work? Well, first we want to write theta dots in terms of theta and theta dots. That's a bit trivial because theta dots equals zero times theta plus one times theta dots. Do you agree with that? Yeah. So that's why in the matrix we have a zero and a one. But next we also want to write theta double dots as a function of something times theta plus something times theta dots. And for this we need this differential equation that we had. Um, we have this differential equation i theta double dots equals c m theta theta plus c m theta dot theta dot. And if we divide both sides by i, then we get. Let me curious my pen keeps deactivating. C m theta divided by i and c m theta dot divided by i. And then we get this part. So this is a whole lot of mathematical shenanigans. And then we have our equation in state space form. And this is often easier to work with because everything is a matrix. This is our entire system. And if we have a matrix, we can also calculate the eigenvalues of the matrix. And these are also the characteristic values of our differential equation. If we use a differential equation or a matrix, it works in the same way. It's just two different ways of writing it. And then we get the same. I get values. Now this is cool. So is this the entire airplane? No, there's a lot more effects. So let's see if we can add those. Um, what actually happens if the airplane pitches up, the wings are also going to get a lot more lift and the airplane will move upwards. And this also causes an effect. And at the same time, if we rotate like this, the wings have a lot more drag, so the airplane, which is moving forward, slows down. And you can just visualize it moving to the left. It doesn't move to the left, it slows down. It has like a negative speed change. So we can take that into account. And what we can also take into account is what the pilot does. The pilot has elevator settings. The elevators are like small flaps at the back of the tail wings. And if we deflect them, then we can rotate the airplane. And it also has thrust settings. We see the engines. If we give more thrust, we go forwards more. So we can also model that. And if we do that, a couple of hours later, we get this enormous state space equation with a ton of coefficients. We can all determine them with physics. Each of these coefficients takes us half an hour to calculate. But after a while, we get this huge set of equations. And this is cool, because this describes the entire motion of our airplane. Um, a few side notes, 
we should divide everything by these moments of inertia i, but we kind of plug those into the coefficients. Um, and yeah, this is a lot of work. But for every airplane, you can set up this matrix. And then you can calculate the eigenvalues. So that's cool. So then you go to Python. Python, here's my matrix. Please give me the eigenvalues. And Python says, cool. Um, this is a four by four matrix. How many eigenvalues are there? Well, you guys didn't know that, but if it's a four by four matrix, there's four eigenvalues. Five by five is five, six by six is six. It's, and you can only do that for square matrices. So a four by three matrix, you don't talk about eigenvalues because it's total bullshit. But a four by four matrix has four eigenvalues. And the first two are two that we actually already found. The first two that Python says is minus four plus minus four i. These are two eigenvalues. They often come in pairs because there's this plus minus. Great. So this is that short period motion that we saw. OK. Python also gives me so-called eigenvectors. Have you already talked about those? Nope. Every eigenvalue has an eigenvector associated with it. <clears throat> and these eigenvectors show in what part of the state space um, everything resides in. So we looked at our state. That was this one. We had the u, horizontal velocity, w, vertical velocity, theta, angle, and uh, theta dot is angular rates. So if we just write that here, u, w, theta, and theta dot, then we can see, OK, in which state vectors does this oscillation reside in? Which ones have large values? W and theta dot. So basically, this oscillation mainly affects our vertical uh, speed and our rotation, and rotational velocity. So we have a lot of rotational velocity, and we also go up and down a bit. So this short period motion, it's like we rotate. We have a large angle of attack. We go up, but immediately we rotate down. Does it make sense that there's a lot of rotational speed? I mean, it's a very quick one, so we have high rotational speeds. And we also have to go like this. We go up and down and up and down. There is not so much time for the horizontal speed to change. And because it's a high speed, like this is in radians per second, and because it's very fast, the velocity is relatively high compared to the actual changes of the angle. So this is great. But we had a 4 by 4 matrix. We should have two more eigenvalues. And the other two eigenvalues that Python gives us are these. Hmm. What does that mean? We have minus 0.02 as a real part. What does that mean? It is stable, it's negative, but it's very likely down. It takes a long while for this to fade out. And we also have point 2i, so that says there's an oscillation, there's a complex part. And it's a low value, so that's pretty low frequency. It's a slow motion that very slowly fades out. And pilots, if you talk about them with them, say, oh, that's the fugoids. Hmm, OK, we're going to. Yeah, let's have a look at that. What's the origin of that name? Fugoid. I have no idea. OK, <laughs> never mind. Um, fugoid. Okay. So what we do is we start to go into a nosedive. As we go into a nosedive, we pick up speeds. More speed means more lift on our wings because we get more air. And then we start to slowly go up again. But then as we go up, gravity works against us. We reduce our forward speed. So there's less air flowing along our wings. We reach the top. And then because we slow down, we start turning down again. Wow. And if you've seen your paper airplanes fly, it's like it goes up. And then it falls again. Have you seen that? Yeah. That's a typical fugoid. Cool. And it's really like a dent, right? Because it's it's almost Yeah. I wow. mean you can look at the peaks. Yeah. I mean the, the, the yellow peak here was at 0.3 and now it's at 0.25 ish. 
So obviously pilots, they just use their elevator to stop this whole oscillation. But if you do nothing with the airplane, it just keeps on doing this for forever, basically. Wow. So yeah, you get the idea. So that's cool. Now we can look at the eigenvectors again and see does it make sense in which eigenvector or in which state parameters does this motion reside in? And you're like, okay. Hmm. I mean, mainly in this u and in this theta. And the oscillation is mainly in the theta. Does it make sense that it goes like down and up? And there's not so much rotational speed. You know, kind of does it a little bit. But it's because it's so slow. The yeah. That's, okay. yeah. Yeah. And this w is actually the velocity with respect to the axis, so it doesn't go like this, but it does speed up and down in its longitudinal direction. So that's why there is a u here. I'm actually unsure why this one isn't larger. I expect that one to be larger as well. But yeah. Is the it, just effect only when you're accelerating, or also when you have a, a, a constant flight speed? Um, how it works with deviations? Um, it's basically like, you know, if I have this, or if I have a, a, a sling. If it's a sling in a stable position, it stays there. If I give it a displacement, no. then it starts. So it's only when you accelerate, then you're operating on well, Or steering, yeah. right? If you, if you put the column down and, and, and then yeah. straight, then it's gone. Yeah. So if you change anything, there's going to be small oscillations that have to then bounce. Now, this is awesome. Um, but why is this useful? And this is useful because when you're designing your new airplane, you can already use some basic physics to calculate these coefficients, C and theta, and everything else, set so up the state space matrices, and then see what kind of oscillations does my system have? Is that what we want? Is my system even stable? Maybe this fuel load increases over time and people get increasingly sick, and that's not what you want. So these eigenvalues, they tell you the vibration modes, and this is very useful for the behavior of the airplane. Is it stable? Are they sufficiently damped, and so forth? And also, is there enough control authority that's in the other matrix? Can we use the elevators of the airplane to fix this? So in a very early stage, you can already make predictions about your airplane, and you don't have to do wind tunnel tests. It was the, the one totally on the right. Uh, uh, yeah. In your head. Uh. Yeah. So in this whole state space equation, this is the inherent behavior of the airplane, what happens when we don't put in any input. And this is what we do when we control it. At, uh, sorry, at what point in like airplane design did they figure this stuff out? Uh, this is typically stuff from the 60s, 70s. Okay, so after airplanes were already quite big. Yeah, I mean, they just started out with, I mean, the very basics, we have a wing, we give it an angle, how much lift does it get? That actually comes from the Wright brothers. Yeah. There's a lot of history behind that. There were so many people trying to do flights, and there were so many people with a lot of money who just built airplanes left and right, and were like, oh, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, this doesn't work. And what the Wright brothers did, they built a wind tunnel, and they started to experiment. What does the wing do when we give it more angle? What are the best shapes of wings, and how does it work with stability? And because the Wright brothers figured out stability before the people with a ton of money did, they managed to get an airplane flying, so that's pretty cool. Would you see the Apollo 5 uh, rocket, uh, the, the Saturn 5 rocket? Yeah. They had uh, five engines, and the middle engine they it was mounted differently, and it uh, oscillated. Uh, and uh, 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 they didn't know what, what, what you were telling. You basically that they found out a little bit later. Uh, so they did. They saw it, and then they tried to fix it. But uh, afterwards, you got all this kind of theory, like, oh, it's actually logical what it did. So stability is very important because otherwise yeah. you just yeah. This uh, almost uh, uh, rockets were almost aborted the Saturn V because the uh, right. the middle uh, engine uh, yeah and what happened was there was a, a feedback uh, circuit the, the the feed line of the of the fuels when it went up the fu uh, the, the the feed line was shorter and then something happened in the engine then the power dropped and then it went down and then. Uh, <laughs> So this is nice, but this is all the symmetric motion of the airplanes. So like everything in its longitudinal plane. But we also have asymmetric motion because an airplane can also roll. That's the roll angle, phi. It can yaw, which is this motion, psi. 
And both these angles also have derivatives. We have a roll speed, we have a yaw speed. And we can also model that. And what's pretty cool is that there's very little interaction between the symmetrical motion and the asymmetrical motion. They pretty much have no effect on each other. So we can model them separately. And if we do that, we get for the asymmetrical motion, a whole new set of differential equations. Great. Cool. We can spend a couple of hours deriving all these coefficients. We can put the matrix in Python, and Python gives us eigenvalues. And this time, we also get four, because it's a four by four matrix. But this time, there's, you know, sometimes they come in pairs, sometimes they don't. This time, we have minus 10. Minus 10, 0 0.01, and then a complex pair. So let's see what kind of motions they have. Um, the first one, minus 10, is the so-called roll mode. Um, is it, what kind of mode, is it highly damped? Is it stable, unstable? I mean, we get something e to the power minus 10t. Does that go to zero or does that grow? It goes to zero. And minus 10 is a high number, so it, it's, it goes very quickly to zero. It's very strongly damped, no oscillations. And it mainly resides in pi dot, in the roll speed. So then just get my. Is this? Uh... Yeah. Okay. So what happens when we give it? It's already over. If we give it a roll angle, it very quickly goes back. To, or if we give it a roll speed, it very quickly goes back to zero. And what happens if we start rolling, we start rolling this way, what happens is that this wing catches a lot more air because it's going downwards. And as a result, the motion is immediately stopped. So that's basically what we see. If an airplane starts rolling, because it has these enormous wings, it immediately stops. It's really resistant to rolling. If it has a roll speed, oh, this is already the next one, it really quickly goes out. How come the angle is not large? The 0 0.03 is the angle itself. Yes. Um, that's because this is a very quick motion. So everything per second, because it's so quick, is a lot bigger. It has to do with the speed. But it is also partly in the angle. So that's cool. But we also have another one, the so-called spiral mode. And the eigenvalue is 0 0.01. That is positive. What does that mean? Is it stable or unstable? Unstable. unstable. So airplanes are unstable. They're all crashing. Hmm. I mean, if we have this function, e to the power of 0 0.01t. I mean, it does grow, but does it grow quickly? It slowly grows over time. It has a very slow divergence, and it mainly resides in the roll angle. So what happens apparently if airplanes fly is that very slowly the roll angle starts growing, 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 growing. Um, it actually varies a bit per airplane. Some of them, they're very slightly stable. Others are very slightly unstable. But if you don't do anything with an airplane, and it just has an angle, then it keeps spiraling. Oh, fun fact, for this video, they have a slightly different airplane. This, this, one, is this one is slightly stable. But generally, if you have an angle, you keep having that angle. And for most airplanes, it slowly grows over time. For this one, it's... Does it also mean that it's, that it is easier to change direction? Because if it would be yeah. really strongly, strongly damped, then it's more yeah, difficult? True. But what it mainly means is, like, is this a problem? If you don't do anything with an airplane, it will crash within 10 minutes. Is that a problem? Not really, because you have a pilot who just, you know, fixes it every couple of seconds. So part of flying an airplane is like, okay, fix it. It's kind of like when you're driving a car on the highway. If you don't do anything, you're going to leave your lane. But, you know, every 10 seconds, you're like, okay, small adjustment. So that's totally fine. That means you're flying an airplane. And now we have autopilots for that, too. So, so it's not really a problem. But isn't that a bit... Uh counterintuitive to the uh, last one where you said that an airplane really doesn't want to roll? Um, it doesn't want to have a roll speed. If there's a rotational motion, that motion is stopped. But if it has an angle, that angle slowly grows over time. Okay. 
And slowly, because if it starts rotating faster, that motion is stopped again. So. Um. And then there's the last one, the Dutch roll. And this one has oscillations. Uh, a real part of mine is 0.6. So that is damped, but not so much, a bit. And an imaginary part of 3, which is medium frequency oscillations. And it kind of lives in everything. Yeah, cool. So that's kind of curious. Sometimes it's damped and sometimes it's not. Oh, no, no, that's not true, right? No, the eigenvectors mean something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's have a look what it means. And this is the typical, typical swiveling of the tail that we saw in a lot of. Is it like this a little bit? Uh... Yeah. Wow. It's like. Oh, wow. It goes all over the place in all motions. Now what happens, <clears throat> suppose we are yawning this way, then this wing moves forward faster, so it gets more lift. So then we also start rolling. But because we start rolling, um, this wing catches a lot more air, gets a lot more drag, and because it has more, Wait, how does it work? Because it goes down, the lift factor actually changes. The lift doesn't go upwards, but it slightly rotates forward. And as a result, this wing starts to accelerate forward again. It's quite complicated, but there's this interaction like, OK, because we're rotating, this wing gets more air, so it gets more lift. And then because we are rotating around the other axis, this lift gets a different angle of attack, gets a different lift factor, and starts speeding up again. And that interacts, and we get these motions. So that's the Dutch rule. Do you guys know why they call it the Dutch rule? Um, early days of airplanes, like around 1910, um, people found this in practice. They were flying and they saw this happening. And it reminded them about Dutch ice skaters. If you go ice skating, you also have the swiveling of the hips. Yeah. And that's where the name comes from. From like 1912-ish, they started to call it the Dutch rule. And it has to do with Dutch ice skaters. So that's pretty cool. It's the international name. I'm not making this up. You can find it on Wikipedia. Wikipedia always speaks the truth. So yeah. So airplane motion is not just one vibration. They're always all present up to various degrees. We can put our airplane mostly in a spiral motion, mostly in a dust roll. They're always all present. And when there's no pilot, then which motion wins in the end? Well, the most unstable one. In the end, everything is going to be damped out, and we're going to get the spiral mode. But we have pilots to compensate for this. Now, I promise you guys experiments. So uh, let's do some more experiments, wake you up again. Um, let's throw our paper airplanes and see if we can detect what kind of modes of vibrations we have. Because this, hmm, what was that? A bit of swiveling, that's roll. And it also went up and down, so also. Um, there was a few point. So take two, three minutes, get your paper airplanes, and see what kind of motions you get. <laughs> and that was a few going. I was like, and down. Oh, wow. And it actually depends on how you throw it. If you throw it with too high a speed, you get more of a few goids. Okay, that was a <laughs> that was a spiral. <laughs> that was pretty cool. Yeah. Wow. So uh, that rotated. we can see these in our paper airplanes. Oh, that was a few right again. No, not the few. The the Dutch roll. Well, it's going to be down. Oh. No, it was. <laughs> okay, I think this airplane is too far away from the modeling. Yeah. <laughs> totally, uh, totally different. Whee! Oh, <laughs> that was a few good as well. You saw how it stalled and then it dropped again. So definitely a few good. That was a good one. Let's see if I can find another one. You saw the wiggling again? Yeah, and also the fugue went up and then down. There was a fugue going, and then it started it's more of a wiggling, the Dutch roll. So all these things that come from maths, 
is stuff that pilots already knew intuitively ages ago, but now we can understand them. And now we can know during the design of our airplane how it affects it. So we can already, in the design phase, very quickly be like, oh, this fuel load is a bit strong, or oh, our roll mode is a bit unstable. <clears throat> um, although in these days, instability is not really a problem. Like here, this airplane has wings at the back. There's also airplanes with wings at the front. Have you ever seen like experimental pictures? Canars? Or... Canars, yes. Um, that's actually more efficient when flying, but it's an unstable airplane. So how does it fly? Autopilots? It's autopilots. It's constantly adjusting. So an unstable airplane isn't necessarily bad. It means you constantly have to adapt because if you don't, it's going to flip over. Jet fighters are really unstable, right? Yes, jet fighters are very unstable. Um, unstable means your airplane is very prone to quickly flip over. If you're in a jet flying yeah. in a fight, you want to quickly flip over at times, so then it's useful. So stability is usually good, but if you want maneuverability, it's actually bad. Cars, if they go forwards, they're stable. If they go backwards, they're unstable. If your job is to just drive straight, you want to go forwards. If your job is to quickly turn, like during parking, how do you do it? Ah. Going backwards, because you're unstable. More mo maneuverability. Higher stability means less maneuverability. So you see it everywhere. Now, OK, so far we kind of know the basics of modeling. And in an early stage, you know, this is important because then we can predict what's going to happen, rough calculations. Later on, we can do simulations, wind tunnel tests, slide experiments, and everything. Um, for the next, um, yeah, do we have until 12 or 12 30? I, I, I could only book this room. Okay. And then for the next hour, I've got another room. So we have okay. more time, but then we have to uh, we'll just see how it goes. I have like 15, 20 minutes left of like teasers for what else you can do. And then we can see. Uh, and I don't know if, if really somebody will come in after. We'll see. So what else can we do with control and simulation and everything? Um, I'll tell you, during my master, I was also working at Dutch Space. Um, Dutch Space, country to the name, they also work with airplanes. And our assignment was to build a simulation for a drone. The drone had already been designed by a company in Spain, and they wanted to put a parafoil on top of it because it had to land in remote conditions. They didn't tell me anywhere about where, but the Iraq war was going on, so probably they had to land in the Iraq desert. So we need to make a simulation of this because they didn't know if they wanted to small or the big parafoil. And with a simulation, you can check how it behaves. So we did that. Um, the first thing we did was literature research. How do we actually model a parafoil? I don't have a clue, but there's books about it. So that was cool. And then we did some hand calculations, very simple calculations. If we have a plane and a parachute in a stable descent, how quickly does it go down? So we find the speed at which the gravity equals the lift force and do some simple calculations. Got us a rough idea. Always good to start with. Good old hand calculations. And then we did simulations. We started off very simple with only symmetrical motions. So only just going down. No shriveling of the tail, no rotation. Started very simple and then added complexity as we went. And then we had the asymmetrical part and we went for a full 3D simulation taking into account everything because we had time left and why not? So we started off as simple as possible, reduced assumptions. And in the end, once we had everything, we also added a very simple graphical visualization because why not? So this is roughly what our graphical uh, visualization looked like. It was basic. We didn't have that much time left. But this gives you a nice idea. <clears throat> and this was a video where we basically flare up. So we're going into descent, but at some point we're about to land. So we pull our parafoil. I don't know if you ever had a parafoil. Yep. If you pull, then you kind of get more lift with more drag. So this is what happens. We're flying. And now we pull the cords. And then our speed drops, especially vertical. And now, ideally, we touch down, because if we don't, we're going to nose forward and pick up a lot of speed again. So that's how that works. And we also have the asymmetrical motion, a steady turn. Is this done in Python also? Or? Um, MATLAB. Yeah, MATLAB, OK. Yeah. But Python works similar. Um, with, if you're on a parafoil, if you pull one rope, then you get more drag on that side, so you slowly tilt over. That's how it works. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to pull on the right cord slowly. As a result, there's more drag on this side of the wing, so we slowly start turning towards the right. And 
see if there's any oscillation. There is there's a steady turn. What do you guys think? Seems smooth. I mean, when I saw this, I thought so too. I'm like, yeah, that's a smooth turn. I like it. Now, this is the visualization, but in practice, you don't use this so much. You use a ton of plots. Every simulation had like 40 of them or so. I plotted basically everything. Um, one thing that I plot was like the ground path, which is like, where are you in space? So we're flying straight, and then we start turning, and then we just make this big turn. Makes sense? Not very insightful. But what's more insightful was the rotational speeds. So that's the next one. Um, a lot of lines, let me walk through. Um, yellow and black are what we did with our controls. So the left, we didn't do anything. The right, we slowly started pulling. And that's the black line. So we started after five seconds pulling, and after 20 seconds, we were pulling as hard as we can. Um, red, green, and blue are the rotational speeds. And the green one is obvious, it's our yaw. We're actually, you know, churning. It has a value. And the blue or red are the roll and the pitch. Um, do you see oscillations? There were oscillations. They were small, but they were definitely present. And what I got from this is, in a graphical visualization, you don't really see much. In plots, you see everything. So plots are way more powerful. But if you want to impress investors, it doesn't look as fancy. We went to Dutch space, and we were like, and my professor was like, "Hello, show the simulation, show the simulation." And we're like, "Ooh, cool," but the engineers were like, "Darn, we want plots. We want to see what's going on." So it really depends on who you're talking to. If it's a manager with that technical background, show them the video. So this was cool. Um, yeah, but how do we make this? I mean, Bart already asked this. Um, we use MATLAB and a tool called Simulink. Maybe some of you use 20SIM in studies. It's very similar. Simulink. Simulink as well. In Simulink, every differential equation just becomes a block. And then you can put blocks and blocks again. So here we have, um, so these two blocks are our airplane. Um, but this is simulated in the time domain, right? In the time domain, yeah. yeah. OK, so then you don't use the state space form. Or do you use that to? Um, state space is when it's linear. This is all nonlinear. Yeah, so we didn't use state space. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is more similar to what you are doing right now. And here's thrust. We had some gravity. We had some force from the cables. And we plugged that all together. And then we got the total forces on everything. And we integrated that to go from forces to accelerations, to speeds, to position. That gives us a state, and we've got that state back to everything else, and we get this whole loop. This is like months of work. Hello, so. there are people standing in front of the door. So I, I, shall we uh, switch to the other room? Uh, uh, yeah, I have like 15 more minutes, so if you're up for that. Yeah, yeah I think it's nice. So I'm going to stop the recording. Um, and. Uh,